Christ is the Son of God who made the covenant with His own blood, that those who will trust Him will not perish but have everlasting life. All right. Let's make our way back to Philippians, please. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'll read the first six verses and remind you what we briefly started studied last time. Finally, brethren, verse 1, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. It is a safeguard for you. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has in mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. The last time we looked at this, we saw how there was joy in a Christian that he meant to chase after. Paul here brings himself now as um, his own assessment to put the silence, this false doctrine, these false teachers were infiltrating the church who believed that you had to be circumcised, you had to work. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. And last time we realized that we're not the false circumcision, those who are born again. We are of the Spirit of God, born of God, and we are the true circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, and we boast in Jesus Christ alone and put no confidence in the flesh which now leads Paul to speak about himself. But I want you to understand something before I break this down. That the Apostle Paul, who was one of the greatest Christians who ever lived planet Earth, he loved Christ. He had passion for the truth. He was zealous for the gospel. He had compassion for the churches, for the people of God. He was ready to die and to be with Christ. And one point in Paul's life, Paul had confidence in trusting in himself. Paul was the most upstanding Pharisee of his time before he was converted, as we will see as we go along. And if anyone could be saved by works, by any kind of works, by the flesh, it would have been the apostle Paul. If there was anyone who could ever enter the kingdom of God, it would have been Paul. <clears throat> we could say Paul was almost a Christian. But there's no such thing, you know that, right? If Paul was almost a Christian because he came so close. You see, Paul, in his own mind, he was convinced that he was doing the will of God. He was convicted that he was doing the will of God, that he was good, that he was okay, that he was on his way to the celestial city. This morning, my desire is that any of you who may think this way will think differently after the service, who will think that God perhaps will accept you because of who you are, because of what you said, because of where you've been born, because of you coming to church here on Sunday, because it's a really nice day out there, and you sacrificed 33 degrees outside, and you came here, you must be almost a Christian. Paul here will explain to us that religion cannot save, studying cannot save, human ability cannot save, sinning cannot save you, not sinning cannot save you, fellowship at Ralph's house cannot save you. 
Paul was deceived. Do you know how many people are deceived that they're born again? In fact, they're actually not. There must be a change that needs to take place. Our beloved Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament by the Spirit of God, at one point in his life, he was deceived in having false confidence. It's a huge concern. And people who trust in themselves, some say they are Christians. One day, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian. I was one yesterday. I lost my salvation. I regained it. What's going on? We need to take this seriously. For there are many who claim Christ, but they do not know Him in a personal, relational, and spiritual way. There are many who claim Him personally, yet have absolutely no union with Christ. There are many who claim to do Christian things, but their hearts are far from Him. Others, they say they've given their life to Jesus at one point, but they have absolutely no love for their Savior, no affection for His people, and no witness for the gospel. I will ask you, is this what we read in the Scripture? That when God saves a person, that person stays the same. We are talking about the Spirit of God who will come and indwell a person. Some of us have seen clips, perhaps, on YouTube of people like Ray Comfort, where he goes on to street ministry. God bless his heart. And he will come across people and says, Hey, man, have you heard of the gospel? He says, Yeah, I am a Christian. Oh, really? What kind of Christian? He says, I'm born again. And then he starts to dig a little bit deeper. And he says, do you have a girlfriend? Yes. Do you have sex with her? Yes. Do you take drugs? Yes. Do you watch pornography? Yes. I ask you, is that a person who's born again? No, it's not a person who's born again. But here's what you're thinking right now. Yeah, but we're not in America, Ralph. They're the only idiots. They're the only false converts. They're the only ones who claim to be born again and have these issues. I'm here to tell you that this is a worldwide pandemic that will kill more people in hell than ever COVID will in the flesh. That people who claim to be Christians and show no Christianity whatsoever. Because if there was anybody that could enter into the kingdom of God with stuff and doing stuff, and pretending and acting and looking like a Christian, it would have been the Apostle Paul. And yet the scripture makes it very clear that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but uh, I remember Brother Wes preaching on Judas. Do you remember that? Maybe you should listen to it again. Judas was handed over the finance. He was the, he was the dude from the financial team. He was entrusted with stuff, with the financial stuff of the church. So he would have looked great. But Judas was not a Christian. He was almost a Christian. Demas, who was entrusted to be a fellow worker with the Apostle Paul, who is, again, I'll say it again, the greatest Christian who ever lived. And Paul himself could not see that Demas was a false convert. He did much ministry with Paul. And some say they have faith, but they lack to reveal their faith of the true regeneration by dead works. Others say they have fellowship with God and God is light, but they have absolutely no problem living and walking in darkness. And in their life, there's nothing but darkness. They say, but Jesus is my light. Jesus is my light and a path where I follow, some look in the mirror of God, on God's law, and instead of seeing themselves as wretched and weak and in need of Christ to continuously work in them, they see beauty. Uh, they see vanity smurf. They say, wow, ah, I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing great. I am so good 
that God is going to really open his arms to me when I enter into his kingdom. Is that a Christian? Some confess Christ, but they deny him by everything that they do in their life. Others claim to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and yet their lives are lived with the unrighteousness of the world, from their jobs to their clothes to their cars to their lifestyle and to the love of the world. Others come and say, hey man, but you know, I'm saved by grace alone. And uh, me and Jesus, we have this thing. You know, it's just me and Jesus. We're buddies. You know, we've got this. He's my elder brother, so if you don't like it, that's, be, that's your issue. You've got an issue. And yet, they have absolutely no problem blaspheming the name of Christ in the way they live. My dear friends, there are many, 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 many warnings in the scriptures about false converts. Many. Not one, not two, not ten. Many. I'm concerned. I'm concerned that there are many false converts in this little congregation. I've titled this sermon Almost a Christian simply because there is no such thing as a false Christian. You are either a Christian or you're not. And if there was anyone who would be close to this, to enter into the kingdom of God without being born again, then it would have been Paul. So, we're going to have only one thing to look at. is false confidence. False confidence. Again, I've entitled the, church, the, the sermon, The Almost a Christian Guy. Okay? The Almost a Christian. Comes so close, but yet he's not a Christian. So look with me at the next few verses that Paul breaks down for us. Again, we will look at the rest next time, God willing. I just couldn't get past this. From verse 4, although I myself, answering back to what he just said, I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. If there's anyone who has confidence in the flesh, I've already attained it. I've already made it. This is what Paul is saying. The word therefore have should be really spelled out having. I am continuously having, trusting. I'm having confidence in myself. I'm depending upon myself. I have boldness in my own self. If anyone says there, and now this is, this is in the Greek, it's a first class condition, which means let's, let's say for the sake of the argument that this is true. This is what this is saying, okay? This is what that kind of if, okay? Just to give you a quick background. Let's say that this is true for the sake of the argument. If anyone is putting that confidence in themselves, in their own works, in whatever they think they've done, whatever they don't think they've done, let me explain to you, my beloved brethren, I have it greater than you, more than all of you, more than the actual dogs and more than the actual evil workers in the circumcision, I far more. If Paul was to say, listen, if there was a scale that you could put on one side that says this flesh here will get you to heaven, mine would be the heaviest because, A, I am greater than all of that. In fact, if you would trust in the flesh, I will put you all on that scale and I'll outweigh you. That's how much confidence Paul had. For the sake of the argument, if this is true, I greater than you. He believed Paul at one stage in his life before he was saved in his own confidence. He believed in his own confession. Even when Paul was persecuting the church of Christ, as we will see, chasing after believers, Paul was convinced that he was actually doing the will of God. He gives us a vivid picture of self-righteous people who don't think they need to be changed if 
a self-righteous person can enter the kingdom of God apart from Christ, then the apostle Paul would have been uh, awaiting for him at the pearly gates, all the, all the musicians and all the angels with trumpets and tambourines saying, hey, that's the man, come. If anyone was going to hear the words, come in, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master, Jesus himself would have welcomed Paul. If there's rejoicing in heaven, in the presence of the holy angels, over one sinner who repents, then for Paul, there would have been prepared a celebration that they would have heard throughout the heavens. You see, Paul genuinely and truly believed that he was right with God. And there are many people in the churches today who genuinely think they are right with God. But just like Paul, unless you have the Spirit of God and you're born of God, you are genuinely wrong. When a person is saved, as I said even before, he's excited. He's excited about the things of God, right? But can it be that a person is not saved and is just excited for just a little bit, just like the, the, the parable of the so four soils? Paul is saying here, I have the credentials. If you think that you can enter the kingdom of God without Christ, I far more. I far more. Charles Spurgeon said this, quote, It very often happens that the converts that are born in excitement die when the excitement is over. Did you get that? When a person is born in excitement, die when the excitement is over. A person's a false convert. He's only joyful and, and only momentarily shows some sort of Christianity and then he walks off. I pray this morning for those who are not converted to be converted, those who are false converted to be converted, and those who are converted, I beg of you, grow in your conversion. You're meant to grow in your conversion, not stay stagnant. And so the Apostle Paul now begins to explain why he had this confidence. And he begins to show us, right, his own privileges by saying what? Look at verse 5 with me. Let's take them one by one. First he says, if anyone else in verse 4 has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised on the eighth day. They were the false circumcision, right? But yet Paul says, but I was circumcised on the eighth day. I come from the right stuff, dude. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Remember, we spoke about this last time. It was a requirement in the, in the Levitical law, in the Mosaic law, rather, that every child born on the eighth day to be circumcised. So Paul is saying from the very beginning of my life, I have to prove I have the proof that I am from God because I was circumcised on the eighth day. I wasn't circumcised later, afterwards, perhaps like Abraham and some others. No, no, no. I was circumcised on the eighth day. He, he, his ritualistic endeavors began when he was eight days old. That's what he's saying. You can't get much more ritual than that. He was presented to God from, from his parents as they were commanded from the scriptures. He was sealed from the very beginning. He was set apart from the covenant to be part of the covenant of Yahweh. And if anyone was going to cut anything off, Paul says, I did it on the eighth day. This is, this is an act of religiosity. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am a Jew. I, I, I'm, I'm a pure Jew. 
But after we know, after Paul's conversion, we know in Galatians, Paul says, Behold, in Galatians 5, 2 to 3, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. So he says, I'm circumcised on the eighth day. That's the first thing. But he continues. You see, if you want to put confidence in something, just pay attention to what Paul is saying. If there was anyone who was ever going to be almost a Christian, it was this guy. Because he continues, he says, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel. Of the nation of Israel. I came out and I was circumcised from the nation of Israel. Why is this important? Because there were Jews that were converted to Judaism. And then they were circumcised. He says, no, no, no. I was circumcised as an eight-year-old boy from the stock of Israel. I am a, a Jew. I'm not a pagan. I am a Jew. He wasn't called a Jew by conversion, but being pure blood. He was not born a Roman. That's what he's saying. Not an Egyptian. Not Italian. Definitely not Italian. But from Israel. You've heard people say, I don't know about you. This is what Paul is saying. Let me explain to you this way. I don't know about you, but Italians have this weird thing. That you say, I'm Italian. And they say, I'm Italian. But then they'll say, I'm a pure Italian. I don't, you know, they really boast in their purity. You know, we have this thing. I'm from Napoli myself. And there are people that are near Na Napoli. So, and they're in here actually in the congregation. And I'll say to that person, I've said to myself, I'm pure Napolitano, you know. Paul is saying he's pure. There's no mixed blood here, right? But he's not so much saying this in boasting. He's saying this, that that's what he boasted in. And that's what actually will never get you into the kingdom of God. He's receiving the, the blessing of Yahweh. He had the privileges of Yahweh. He was under the law of Yahweh. And the truth was preached to them. The prophets came to them. The covenant was given to them. Paul says, I've got this. And there is no other chosen nations. But Israel, I come from these guys. Yahweh called these people his people. He didn't call Italians his people, nor Chinese, nor Germans, nor Maltese. He called the nation of Israel his people. And Paul is saying, I belong to these people. And more than that, just to flesh it out a little bit more, just in case we didn't understand Paul, Paul says, I don't just come from the nation of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, man. Do you get that? Like there were 12 tribes, but only two of them stayed faithful to, to Yahweh. Well, with the occasion of hiccups. And it was Benjamin and Judah, where God used these tribes to bring about the temple where he was built in a holy city where they would actually offer up sacrifices. And Paul says, I'm not just from the nation of Israel. I am from the right tribe. And what's he saying? Why is he saying this? Because the other tribes went off tantrum. And Paul says, I am from the right tribe, from the tribe that stayed faithful to Yahweh. And by the time Paul penned these very words, well, the people were probably so Hellenized, they probably didn't even understand what Paul was saying, meaning that the Greek culture would have confused them. And he was trying to make a, a point that this is the, the tribe that stayed faithful to God. And more than that, he continues, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul would have been so religious. This is what this is saying, that he would die for his religion. This would be like, you know, the Catholics. Sorry about the Catholics. I am an ex-Catholic, so I can pick on myself. And when the gospel was preached to me, you know what I said? I am a Catholic and I will die a Catholic. Right? 
Paul is saying, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, means I am serious about this. Serious as a heart attack. I was serious as a heart attack, not even knowing why I said what I said. You can be so easily deceived in believing some lie for years and thinking it's true. He's saying, I am not from a mixed race. I am not a proselyte. I have the privileges of all the Judaism. If you can put me, uh, if you can name uh, a number one to ten in what kind of a Jew I am, I'm 11. I am 11. He would have been a religious person doing all the religious acts, all the duties. He would have went to Hebrew school, was obedient to his parents. Children, pay attention. Be obedient to your parents. He was brought up in accordance to the law. And his argument is not to boast in these brothers and sisters. His argument is that none of these things were going to get him into the kingdom of God. And by the way, let me just quickly say something. Paul is not saying that these things are wrong in and of themselves. Circumcision and, and, and you know, being a Hebrew. He's not saying that. That's not what his argument is. It's okay to be a Hebrew. It's okay to be you know, uh, Algerian and, and Greek. That's not what he's saying. He's just making a point that these things, they will not add nor subtract to anyone's salvation. And then Paul continues. He's assessed himself. He has shown his privileges. And now he wants to show us his achievement. What he, uh, he is and he has become. Look at verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, of Hebrew Hebrews, as to the law, I'm a Pharisee, man. A Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee. The spiritual elite. The ones who were zealous. The ones who desired only to be circumcised in the flesh, but not in the spirit. Not in the heart. And the Pharisees were a bunch of people who thought they were super spiritual. A bunch of people who were set apart. Well, they, they set themselves apart. So much so. That to them, it will be like this. When I enter the kingdom of God, I've been so set apart that in heaven, there's an extra rejoicing for me. You know, because I've been set apart and kept the law of God. Man, I mean, these guys were so set apart that they try to keep the 613 laws. Wow. That, by the way, that's in here. And so that they wouldn't break these laws, they put other laws around it to keep maybe perhaps another 613 laws. Praise God for His grace, right? I mean, these guys were nuts. Paul says, I was crazy. I kept the law. I wasn't just born in the nation of Israel. I wasn't just in a tribe of Benjamin. I'm not just committed. I am set apart. I am set apart, distinguished from everyone else. I do not look like that guy over there. You, buddy. I don't want to look like him. That's okay. No one can know who I'm pointing at. Or him or that lady. I'm set apart. But can I share something with you, what these guys actually did? I want to share with you, because when we come to the application, it will make sense. They read the Bible. Did you know that? They believed and loved the Bible. They studied the Bible. In fact, they taught the Bible. They were devoted to the Bible, and they tried to keep the Bible to a T. Do you understand that? This is what a Pharisee used to do. But they will point fingers, of course, and judge everyone else according to what they were doing. Yeah? The Pharisees were a bunch of people who set themselves apart, who thought that they were right before God, but inward, they were as dark as hell. They thought externally they look right. They had the right passion externally. They thought they were filled with righteousness, 
but they were missing the sun of righteousness in their heart. They might have had passion for God, but their heart was not for God. In fact, the Apostle Paul goes further than that. In Galatians, he actually tells us he was above his contemporaries. Right? Let me just read it to you. Galatians 1.14, I was advancing, advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries, among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ex ancestral traditions. So he wasn't just a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he was under teaching of Gamaliel. I think that's how you say it. In Acts 22 verse 3, he was a very well-known Jewish teacher of that time. What does that tell us then, brothers? Paul was very well known in the scriptures. I want you to understand that. Paul was well known in the scriptures. Paul would have known way more than any of the people that he's trying to rebuke about the scriptures. Paul would have sat here right now and Ralph and Wes would have been in the background like little, little mice in comparison to the understanding that Paul had in the scriptures. But Paul, at this time, he was but almost a Christian. And then he continues, read with me please, verse 6. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Paul was a fanatic in his belief. Do you know what that means? I call him a loony Jew. He was a loony Jew. You like that one, Samuel? He was crazy. Not loony tune, but loony Jew. That's okay. It was, a, it was a joke in my head that just didn't go well. He was fanatic. If someone was passionate about their beliefs, jealous to protect their religion, it was Paul. Paul was very sincere in what he believed. He didn't muck around. He was ready to die for his deep convictions and the faith that he had at that point. But Paul w wasn't what we would call a bench warmer at church. Okay? Paul was nothing like that tick in the box guy. He was zealous. And that word zealous speaks of someone who was alive, active, and driven with devotion. He will do anything to do what? He says, zealous, a persecutor of the church. I mean, that's how zealous he was. He was convinced that by persecuting the church, he was doing the will of God. He was proud of doing this. He believed that what he was doing was right. And in his zeal, he believed he was gaining favor with God. And what we can learn from this really quickly is that we can be very, very zealous about something, deathly zealous about something, and eternally wrong. Just because one is passionate about something, it does not mean that that passion is godly. Paul was passionate. In the ways and in the eyes of Paul, Paul looked like he was almost a Christian. Yet Paul was more the son of hell than any other Pharisee. That's his point. He did right. He looked right. He didn't do anything wrong. This is a point that Paul is trying to bring across. Paul is saying, if you think you're zealous, I've overcome your zealous. If you think you're Jew, I'm more than you. I come from a better tribe. I have more passions, more affections. In these things, I do not boast. And if that's not enough, let's have a look at verse 6. How this guy saw himself before he became a Christian. Look at verse 6. 
as a zeal of persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. I mean, don't you just love Paul? Don't you just love him? I feel so bad right now. I mean, Paul is saying that he was keeping the law. No one can come close to him. I have passed all the tests. If anything external could save you, I'm that guy. I am that guy. Paul was not caught up in any hidden sin. He didn't hang around with bad company. He didn't hang around with people who went night clubbing. He, he, he didn't do any of that stuff. He was an upstanding man. He says blameless, which simply means without fault. You couldn't fault this guy. He was honest, a straight shooter. He was morally upstanding. In fact, if we did a good person test with the Apostle Paul, I thought about this, he would have been the worst guy to talk to. I would probably dump him to Samuel. Because he would have, he would have said, man, I've kept him. It, it, really? So you've kept the whole law? Blameless? From when? From the eighth day. I was eight days old. When I was circumcised on that day, I made a covenant with Yahweh. I, I'm saved, you know. But this is Paul's argument. Paul's argument is that in all of this, there is one ingredient missing. Christ. Christ is missing. Christ is missing. Paul is showing that this is self-confidence. Apart from Christ, you can say to yourself this morning, I'm almost a Christian, which means you're not. So we begin by giving an application. How do we apply what we just said? I mean, I just gave you the theology. This is what it is. This is what the Bible said. How do we apply this? Maybe some of you boys were taken to the doctor and were circumcised on the eighth day, maybe on the ninth or the twelfth, and maybe you think you're a Christian. Or maybe some of you were brought up in a Christian home and, and you were given over to the elders. He comes and the elders lift him up to the Lord as an offering, not a sacrifice, but to say it's a blessing. God bless this child, bless the parents, and maybe you think you're a Christian. Or maybe you are like a, the Catholics, have a background and they believe that baptism is part of salvation. Or maybe you were baptized in this church by the elders and you're a member. Does that make you a Christian? No, it doesn't. Unless Christ rules and reigns in your heart, you're still not a Christian. Or maybe you prayed a prayer and says, Jesus, forgive me. And you believe that you're saved. And you trust that prayer that you did. And in that prayer, you have faith. Because you remember 15 years ago, you did a prayer. Or 15 years ago, you were baptized. You say, well, I must be saved. Because 15 years ago, something happened. Can I share something with you? Now, this is off my notes. I literally spoke to a, a person years ago, and I was trying to share the gospel with this old lady, and I asked the son, I said, hey, man, is your mom saved? Oh, yeah, my mom is saved. She had no idea of the gospel. She had no idea she needed to repent, believe in the gospel, trust in Christ, that she was a sinner before God. She didn't understand so hell. She, I said, okay, I, I, what made you say that? This is not a lie as God is my witness. Oh, well, 22 years ago, she was at church and she felt this emotion. She felt Jesus. Your mom has no fruit bearing after 22 years. What kind of root was she planted in? If Jesus is the root that brings forth fruit, there's an issue with Jesus then, if there is no fruit bearing. Again, we look at our congregation, we see Australians, Italians, Chinese, Syrian, I can't remember, Ukrainians, half Argentinian, half confused at the back there, 
You know, we see all this nationality in this one place. Can your nationality save you? Because according to the scripture, Paul says, hey, the only nationality that Yahweh blessed was Israel. And it was not Algeria, nor Egypt, because Jesus went to Egypt, you Egyptians. They're not here. Where are they? The Egyptians are not here today. There's only one. No. But in Christ, in Christ, all nations are called. In Christ, all people are called. They are called to come to him, for he will give them rest. In Christ, there is a greater blessing than being Greek, German, Chinese, or Italian, or even Israelites. Because Christ is the Son of God who made the covenant with his own blood. That those who will trust him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Or maybe some of you say, well, I was born in a Christian home especially some of you young guys, younger people. My grandfather was a Christian. His grandfather was a Christian. M my cousin is a Christian. My mother is a Christian. My daddy is a Christian. I must be a Christian. Because if there was anyone like this, let me tell you, the Apostle Paul will outdo you. You are not a Christian because of your heritage. You become a Christian when you give your life to Jesus Christ. When you say, Christ, take over my life. I want you not only to be my Savior, but to be my Lord. Jesus never said, not everyone who says to me, Savior, Savior, will enter the kingdom of God. He said, Lord, Lord. If Jesus is not Lord of your life, he's not your Savior. Because if that's true, then Paul would have been okay. If anyone had a get out of jail card, it would have been the Apostle Paul. I've been brought up in a religious home, Ralph. My parents teach me. My mom does catechism with me. She does homeschooling with me. I, I do all these wonderful things. Great. I want to encourage you to teach your children. It is actually scripture tells you to teach your children. But when your children, this is to you parents, when they re recite to you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him should not perish ever everlasting life. Praise God for that. That won't save them. Don't think that a child is saved simply because he recites the scriptures. From the scriptures comes the knowledge of God, and from the scriptures we are saved. You must give the gospel to your children. Because if anyone was going to be saved once again, it would have been the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul would have learned to recite scripture according to Jewish tradition. They would have learned the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, by 14 years old. And that's a person with a brain that I don't have. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee above all the other Pharisees. But what does he tell us about us? By the way, I am not telling you not to teach your children. I am telling you teach your children and give them the gospel. Don't teach your children to behave. Because Paul was taught to behave. Ex what I mean, that, that's external. Okay? If Paul was a Pharisee, what can we learn from being a Pharisee? Well, I'm going to give you three things for us. You can know a lot of things about a lot of things. Do you understand that? You can know a lot of scripture and still come close to kiss the face of Jesus only to be told, get away from me. I never knew you. You can go home and you can grab the biggest, fat, systematic theology book that you can find of John MacArthur and Wayne Grudem and some other guy and read them. And you can articulate all the justification, sanctification and glorification and put them together and still end up in hell unless you're born again. Because the Apostle Paul 
was intellectually driven. In fact, if you read later on, some of the people told Paul he was going mad from his intellect when he was saved. Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but they testify of me. So if I'm going to read the scriptures, I need to find the gold. I need to find the jewel of great price, which is Christ. Two, unless you read the scriptures in the gospel through the, the gospel lenses, you're going to become nothing but a Pharisee. And if you haven't figured it out, a Pharisee is unsaved, yeah? So just, just in case that we... You didn't miss that. But can I say something? Can Christians sometimes be like Pharisees? You know, just pointing and just pointing at people and pointing at people. Can I encourage you when you say that guy is not saved, that guy may be saved, that one maybe is not saved, I don't know, that guy, maybe the other guy. Can I encourage you? By the Spirit of God, if you're born again, as you point that one finger at someone and actually gossip and slander someone, even in your own heart, may God cause you to point the other nine back at you so that you can examine your own heart as you being a Pharisee in thinking that you can read people's hearts. We can only see external. We cannot read someone's heart. I do not know who is saved and who is not. Time will tell. And we can be very much like Pharisees and point the fingers. But on the other hand, I want to flip it the other way. If someone is coming to you with love, what I mean by pointing the finger that maybe trying to challenge you, are you saved or not? Do you get angry? Do you get upset if someone says to you, hey man, I haven't seen you at church. I haven't seen you in the fellowship. I haven't seen you come to the men's study. You barely come on Sunday. Do you get angry? Then you must examine yourself. You must examine yourself. Yes. And three, of course, you can also teach the Bible and about the kingdom of God and still not enter the kingdom of God because that's what Paul was doing. Paul was teaching. In fact, there are many men from the past, as you will know, people like Martin Luther, John Wesley, and John, uh, George Whitfield. They taught the Bible for many, many years. In fact, Martin Luther taught at a seminary. <laughs> And he wasn't saved. It doesn't mean anything unless a person has truly been converted by God. So, where do we go from here? You run to Christ. You run to Jesus. And you say, God, change me. If you are seeing that there is no fruit bearing, and you have confidence only in what you said years ago and what you have done, please, I beg of you, what makes you think that you're a Christian? On what basis are you saying that you're a Christian? Who is lying to you to say that you're a Christian? If you have no desire, no zeal, no compassion for the people of God, for the gospel, for Christ, why are you saying that you're a Christian? Who can testify that you are a Christian? Who can say, I am a Christian? What happens when a person is saved? That zeal is changed. The zeal that Paul had was changed. The passions were changed. His drive was changed. His whole life was changed. Paul now had affections and desires for the things of God properly, for Christ, to magnify Christ, to exalt Christ, to make Him known. Could it be that some of you are here this morning who think they're saved and you are sincerely wrong, like the Apostle Paul? Could it be that you are fooled? Paul was religious, but he wasn't converted. Paul went around and he preached whatever he thought he was preaching as truth. Do you? Do you know those people that come knocking on your door? Oh, it's Jehovah's Witness. 
I don't know if you do that. I don't. I actually grab the Bible and give them the gospel. But here's the thing. Do you know they're very, very zealous in what they do? Right? But they are very, very wrong, aren't they? Or do we agree with them? They are very, very wrong in what they are preaching. Can it be if the Apostle Paul himself was convinced, full, and deceived to believe that he was right with God, could it be possible that one of us in here are like that? We need to go to the cross. I want to read you what happens to Paul for the next time as an application. Look with me in Philippians. And I'll leave that in God's hands for you to examine. Philippians 6, and then I'll continue. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But what happened to Paul? You see that but? What happened to Paul? Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count how many? All things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered all things and count them as rubbish so that I may gain Christ. You want to know how you're walking with God and if you're born again, then you become this. You count everything as loss. And you count it as loss for Christ's sake. There's no such thing as I'm almost a Christian. There's no such thing as a false Christian. There's only Christians. And the way you become a Christian is that you repent and you believe in the work of Jesus Christ. Alone. Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for your word, for your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, I pray that you will season this word with grace, for this is your grace to people, your grace to reveal to us, Father, that nothing will allow us to enter into the kingdom unless we come through Christ. But Father, when you work, you work. If the work of Christ is at work in us, that it will manifest itself. Your work is not dead, but is life. May we examine if our lives reflect the life that we proclaim to have in Jesus Christ. So thank you, Father, for this privilege to go into your word. And may you bless it and bless us with this truth. May we not just walk away and talk about football and cricket and soccer, but meditate on what we learned, that Christ will be magnified in us. Amen.